right, we'll get started. So everyone, welcome to Backup and Restore of Federated Systems. Uh, my name is Mark Belinsky. I'm one of the technology architects here at InterSystems, uh, responsible for system sizing and planning for our health share, track care, and now InterSystems Iris, <laughs> among the rest of the data platforms, um, product family. Um, so we'll be discussing uh, what a federated system is and, and how best to ensure referential integrity uh, or transactional integrity across uh, a federation or multiple instances. So just to go over what a federated system is, it's essentially you know, multiple database, database instances grouped together uh, or tied together that make up the system as a whole. Uh, they can provide different functions or different roles, provide the same role but in a you know, load balance or vertical or horizontal scaling model. Uh, in most cases, there's a, a reliance or a requirement to have logical uh, integrity uh, or consistency across all the systems that make up uh, the federation, if you will. Some applications, the federation as a whole uh, is not operational unless you have all the parts functioning and, and at a consistent state. A um, couple examples. Uh, our health share information exchange, uh, and as of this morning, the InterSystems IRIS, especially with the sharding capabilities, um, are considered uh, federated systems. So, to address the referential integrity requirement, uh, first let's discuss what the actual data protection and copy management requirements are to support you know, a wide range of use cases. Uh, these can include your standard recovery point objectives, recovery time objectives, or RPO and RTOs, um, part of your organization's DevOps cycle, um, regular database integrity checks, uh, and even you know, some important investigations or you need a, a copy of production that's quiesced, but you need support, to, to support developers to log in to look at data to see if something strange has happened within the application. So, Data protection is protecting the business operation uh, and it should be your number one goal or objective for any backup solution, period. Um, the business impact uh, or, or loss of revenue or customers uh, should be the number one item that drives any of your backup designs uh, or any of your backup operation. Um, you know, think of it as an insurance policy. Uh, the, the, these are your simplest forms and like I mentioned earlier, your your RPOs, your recovery point objectives, or your RTOs. Um, basically, uh, ev everyone familiar with R RPOs, RTOs, so I don't want to waste much time on it. Um, but again, it's the core of the backup is the first to support the resiliency of uh, the business operation. So you hear, you hear a lot about DevOps. It's going beyond uh, the traditional support of your RPOs and RTOs uh, in the traditional sense. DevOps is becoming or already is uh, a large influence as part of uh, supporting your business operations. Um, this will require an agile approach to the dev portion of DevOps. Um, you hear the term DevOps a lot lately, but really what is it? It's, it's really, it's, it's the compound, you know, even in the literal sense of the term, <laughs> of development and operations and, and trying to find a happy medium between them. Uh, because sometimes sysops and devops are diametrically opposed to each other and, and you see a lot of arguments and fighting uh, amongst developers and their ability to be agile versus the sysadmins who are like, they don't want to protect or they don't want to present an environment that ever fails, where DevOps assumes failure domain as and if something fails, you provision another one, you know, especially when you hear you know, about containers. Um, but it's great buzz, buzzwords, um, but really what does DevOps play as part of you know, backups? Well, rapid environment provisioning is, is or, or cloning of a production um, or an, for a non-production use, you know, certainly aids in, in supporting the speed of, of the DevOps. You know, in a true DevOps environment, let's say you have you know, a typical restore of a multi-terabyte environment, you know, it might take you several hours uh, or even days to complete. Uh, doesn't help all that much of a DevOps environment when request comes in and you need you know, 
know, several hours or a couple of days just to give them a new environment kind of breaks the whole paradigm of, of having a DevOps. So we have our requirements. We know what we need to do. All right, we need to do our backups. We need to support DevOps, but okay. The challenge isn't doing that. Um, most grid plans um, usually get derailed because of cost constraints or budgeting shortfalls. You know, and, and again, I can't stress this uh, enough: is you know, data protection is the insurance policy for business operations, and, and, and a lot of times that's I don't want to say ignored, but uh, oftentimes it's not given the priority it should be. You know, other influences or chal challenges are you know, backup windows, resources needs to be non-disruptive to the application, and so on. And then there's the federated environment. It, there's, there's caveats about a federated environment um, that are many times overlooked. I'd probably say the majority of the times they're overlooked um, because in most cases it's, it's not given much uh, thought because, well, you know, I, I may be running a backup every night and doing all the instances, part of HealthShare or InterSystems Iris sharding, and that, that's great. You know, and it might even be close enough within a backup window. Um, well, that may may not be enough, because especially you know, an admin might say, "Well, I'm syncing servers with NTP time, and uh, I'm using cron or some backup scheduling product that will schedule my backups to run at 1 a.m. every night." You know, yeah, yeah, that's great, but even if you can get it synced to one second of when database freeze happens. A lot can happen less than one second. I mean, we can, you know, if you think of just what HealthShare Cache or InterSystems Iris can do per second, we can do millions of transactions in a second. Um, so, well, so consider the following scenario. As we just mentioned, we have our 1 a.m. Uh, time period. Uh, let's use HealthShare Information Exchange as in the example. Here we have a registry, patient index, an edge gateway, and an access gateway. Very typical of a health shared deployment. Sysadmin sets up a backup job to start at 1 a.m., you know, but really is it 1 a.m., zero minutes, zero seconds, zero sub-second, blah, 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 exactly. Uh, not really. So here we have a graphic that actually shows you what more often than not would probably happen. So let's take that presumed 1 a.m. backup time. You know, here you can see the external freeze was called on each of the instances within a health share environment or, or a federated application. The actual time when the write daemon actually freezes uh, and all the dirty blocks are written uh, to the cache that that's across all the instances could have a time gap. Um, uh, and that presents a problem for your entire federation of, of, uh, as a whole. Uh, so there could be sub second, second, seconds, or even minutes uh, between all the different instances in the federation. And if you're ever to restore that backup, um, of those cache.dat files, uh, they would not be at the exact point in time. Uh, so you see in the example here, here we have one at you know, one a.m. two seconds, you know, two seconds and you know, six hundred microseconds, and so on and so forth. So you can see there's at least a, a, almost a four-second gap uh, between when all of them happen and. The transactions can happen in that time if you recover. Now, if you ever have to recover and you have the original journal files from the storage array at that time, then you're all good because then you can recover up to that point in time because you have the journal files. But what if you don't? Um, so just to recap what that problem is, though, a little bit, is using the traditional method you know, when using a federated you know, multi-instance environment uh, traditional storage backups, snapshots, you know, CBT or you know, change block tracking, uh, or even in cache online backup, um, and that's having that. The big if is if you have your original journal files, and more often than not, if you're recovering uh, your production environment, maybe because of storage failure, data center failure, server failure, whatever, um, you would not be at an exact point in time. However. Um, it, it just, how do I say it, the, the reliance on the journal files at that point in time becomes you know, paramount to get you to that exact point in time. 
Additionally, uh, it's, there's a manual process many times to do that. So you have the user, you know, sysadmin come in, they have to run the journal restores, and it's a long process. So you're, you're probably wondering, <laughs> great, now what? I'm, 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 I don't have a good backup environment, my healthcare environment, or InterSystems Iris, and you know, how, do, how, how do I get an absolutely clean environment or a clean backup of a federated environment? Well, the introduction of all flash storage arrays, especially uh, those that have advanced storage features um, that include storage protection or consistency groups. Uh, there's a lot of different flash arrays out there today. Um, a lot of them offer very similar features, um, EMC, uh, NetApp, uh, pure storage. Um, but the benefit of what a protection group, though, is it alleviates that point in time gap that we saw in the previous demonstration where we showed the 1 a.m. and up to almost four seconds in time gap. These consistency groups allows you to have a complete snapshot taken across the consistency group for all the disks involved. And it's not even just the disks involved with one server. It's all the disks involved with all, all disks, all servers. So if you have four different servers or 40 different servers and you have, I don't know, maybe 100 different storage volumes or LUNs, you can get an exact point in time snapshot across all of them, presuming that they're all on the same array. That's, that's the only caveat. I don't know of any story. Well, I, I take that back. There is a way uh, using another technology, um, an external appliance, um, an IBM sand volume controller is one example where you can have multiple arrays, but we're not talking about that one right <laughs> for today. Um, so. Now I'm going to show you an example of, of how we can actually accomplish this using you know, pure storage flash arrays and catalogic ECX. Um, so there's several other options available as well, um, but for this session we're, we're just going to focus on just this combination um, just so we can get down in the weeds a little bit of, of exactly what happens. So to plug a little commercial here for uh, both pure storage and catalogic, um, we have out in the partner pavilion, um, both are represented here this week, um, but we're just going to highlight, you know, the technology capability of these, uh, and I don't want to go through them uh, in, in great um, detail, but, you know, Pure Storage Flash Array provides all the goodness uh, of all Flash Arrays or AFAs, especially, if, you know, when it comes to the snapshot and cloning capabilities um, and the consistency groups or protection groups, as they call them. Uh, Catalogic ECX is a, a data copy management platform um, that orchestrates and, and catalogs all the copies uh, and replication or clones. Uh, one key point I'd like to point out, um, unlike any other backup software, is ECX is 100% out of band from the data itself. It doesn't touch any, any of your data itself. Uh, it's purely done by interacting with the APIs within, within the storage array itself. So. Just to go a quick overview of what the backup process is. So here we have ECX. It's going to do an inventory scan. We're going to create an SLA policy. And then we're going to define a backup job. Very simple, very clean. So here we have a, a, an example where I have you know, ECX in the upper left-hand corner deployed as a virtual appliance on any existing you know, VMware vSphere cluster. Uh, so ECX communicates directly to the flash array. Uh, and the database server is making up your federated environment. So when I mentioned earlier about going out and cataloging uh, your inventory, so it's go out, scan what storage arrays you have, tell it what database servers you have, easy stuff. Um, so here in this scenario, we have two production database servers. Um, one happens to have three instances uh, of HealthShare on it. Um, another one only has one instance, so, uh, and I'll get it, I'll break down the details as to uh, what exactly? Uh, note that this uh, process doesn't require a flash array, um, two flash arrays in, in the primary data center. It's, you know, it's just good practice to protect from the unlikely event that there's an issue with the production array. Um, on the far right, uh, now, now, sorry, you got to come to my next session for that one. But so we'll just focus on the left side for now, which is our primary data center. Um, so to expand on the configuration used in a little bit more detail, here 
it, it shows the servers. On the left, server A consists of the three database instances. Uh, here we're going to have um, an access gateway, an edge gateway, and a registry from HealthShare. It's going to be sitting on two disk volumes. There's LUN1, LUN2. Um, and then on the right, we have the production server B. Um, that has one database instance or HealthShare instance. It's the patient index and one disk volume. And this is purely for uh, example purposes. You can have multiple disk array or multiple LUNs presented, multiple instances, or just one. Um, so there's any number of combinations you can use here. So in ECX, we, we ran the inventory scan. Uh, we cataloged the, the flash arrays and the database servers that, that we care about. Uh, then we create a simple SLA policy by, by defining the frequency and the interval of the retention, and then define the replication target uh, for backup and replication. My example here, I circled on the right. I set up an SLA policy for seven days to keep the source snapshots and 30 days for uh, keeping the destination snapshots. I, I believe these are the defaults, and I just left them at that for now, but you can configure it any way you want. You can get crazy with it if you want to. Um, so there's just countless numbers um, of possible combinations. And I apologize if the screenshots are a bit small. Um, the presentations will be made available on, in PDF form, I believe, at the end of the conference on Wednesday or Thursday. I think they'll be available. Um, but uh, the ECX UI, it's very intuitive. It's easy to use. Um, so there's, there's no drama there at all. Um, so great. So now we have an SLA policy defined. We have the inventory scanned or in reverse order of that. So now let's create a backup job. So my example here, I selected uh, you know, the four separate health share instances because we cataloged it. And we see here we have the access gateway. We have the edge gateway, the registry and the patient index, four instances, three on one server, one on the other. You know, then I select the SLA policy I just created, you know, and then under the covers, ECX and Purity. Purity is the uh, Pierce Flash Arrays uh, OS, lack of a better term. Um, creates the protection group and, and the snapshot uh, management is all handled under the covers. So, and we can see it here, so just taking a quick screenshot of what purity looks like, you'll see here that on the top right I circled uh, uh, the three volumes, um, again, because there's only my, uh, in my scenario, my two instances uh, on one server share alone. Um, those three volumes are part of kind of a cryptic looking protection group uh, that's created by ECX under the covers itself, and, and that's circled here on the lower left. You really don't need to be worried about the naming conventions because that's all handled by uh, the ECX software. Um, and it's really only meaningful to e ECX. But here, just I just wanted to show that it actually, ECX went out and created the protection group right on the flash array itself. So the benefits of the protection group, and this is where I want to show you that, that time gap. Um, so let's say, you know, we have you know, the multiple components, we have the WIDs, we have the database files, the journal files. So here's where you know, the, the secret sauce comes into the whole solution. So if we take that same 1 a.m. backup and we had the different uh, backup points of when the freeze came back and reported as being clean, that's great. But the snapshot doesn't happen until all of them have come back and said that they're clean. And then the snapshot's taken across all the volumes, the database volumes, the journal volumes, everything. And it's not only important that that happens after the thaw, or I'm sorry, after the freeze of the database. The important part is it's taken after uh, all the instances are, and then across all volumes, that snapshot is consistent at an exact point in time. And, and that's, that's the benefit of where this comes into play, especially with the protection groups. So great. So now we actually have a, a clean backup on disk, federated environment um, that we can use to do whatever we want with it. So now let's get into a little bit of, you know, generating a restore or clone of an environment. Um, again, using, you know, pure storage and catalog ECX. Um, 
there's other options as well, uh, especially within under you know, ECX itself and other flash, ar flash arrays and other technologies. But again, I just want to focus as this is just one, ex one example that's possible. So overview of, of what a restore process will be like. You select the instances from the backup job. Um, the timestamp will be given uh, per the backup job. So at this time, of, in my example, I did one at August 10th at 10.25 in the morning, you know, 52 seconds. And that's when my exact point in time was taken across all the volumes. Um, and then you choose your target, um, your restore target. And then once you actually do a restore, then, then you can choose an action in terms of, do I want to keep it permanently? Do I just want to cancel it and destroy it? Do I want to use you know, short term, long term? Uh, you, have, you have some options. So. So after we have that all done, we create a restore job. And I selected the backup I wanted again at, at 10.25 a.m. Uh, it's the exact point in time across all four health share instances, including databases and journals. Uh, in this site, I, uh, or in this example, I selected uh, the Bangor site, which is the top one I've highlighted or circled here above. So that's my primary site. Um, I'll get into the other one in the next session in a little bit as to extending this model. Um, for backup restoration um, and recovery of, for supporting production, you know, DevOps, you know, from the second array uh, is literally instant, you know, regardless of the size of the volume. So we did some testing, you know, we, we did a, a multi-terabyte environment. It was backup and accessible in, in less than two minutes. Um, So now I set up, so and for my example here, I did it as a DevOps thing. So I wanted to create like a scratch environment or stage, whatever you want to call it, um, where I restored, you know, two production servers, you know, those four database instances uh, to a single, you know, test dev server. Um, so here we have an example where I have those three LUNs. Those three LUNs consisted of four database volumes. Um, and then we'll have four instances on one database server. So after restore is complete, uh, you know, we, we now have an entire federated environment up and running. Um, took uh, actually about three minutes uh, to be exact. And it could be used for, you know, cloning of, of any environment. Now, the really neat thing here is we actually didn't restore a single byte of data. Um, because the data is already there and existent as part of the snapshot uh, from within the storage array itself. Um, you can do anything you want with these environments, and now I'll get into some sp some use cases of where you know, this can be really uh, beneficial in an environment. Um, because again, right now we're sitting on a, a single storage array, um, so in in the event of that array failing, you lose these snapshots. But uh, we'll, we'll get into some different scenarios in a little bit. Um, so on the left terminal, um, I showed a C control list output. You know, what was once the production instances, they're now restored um, as a non-production environment. Uh, and they can be, again, used for anything, dev, test, stage, integrity checks, and I'll get into more examples in a little bit. The same process and speed can be applied to restoring production. Um, so if, if something should happen to a production, maybe you know, bad code and went out, uh, you applied a backup or I'm sorry, applied a, an application update, went out there and smashed your data and did something really stupid and, and all of a sudden you lose, you know, tons of data, tons of clinical records, tons of transactions, whatever. And just restore your, your production data back until the, the point. Now you can run, when I create that SLA policy, you can set this up to run, I think is granular is every 15 minutes, I think as low as it can go. So you can theoretically take a snapshot every 15 minutes of your data. Don't know if that's practical, um, but depends on your RPO and RTO uh, requirements. Um, so now, one, once we have this, so when I did my restore, I did it as, as a non-production environment. Um, Consider it a clone or a snap of the environment. Yeah, it's, you know, let's say it's used part of DevOps. Um, 
or some other ad hoc you know, short-term need. You could choose to either then make it permanent or destroy the environment. So here on the, the lower left, you'll see there's an option for the job. You can either choose to make it permanent uh, or, or basically destroy the environment. No harm. Um, so you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of different use cases, uh, and they're actually endless op uh, opportunities or options to do. Supporting DevOps is very obvious. Uh, you can create environments very quickly. You, know, you stand it up, you want a fresh copy of production every day. Sure, it'll take minutes to do, or uh, you want to break off a copy to do some sort of analytic, you know, heavy-duty ad hoc SQL reporting. Sure, have at it that way. You won't uh, you won't impact production workload. Um, nightly database integrity checks. Um, some something I I, I want to keep harping on the customers. It's really important to have your database integrity checks run as often as possible. It doesn't have to be daily, even if you did it weekly. There's a very easy way to do it to run integrity checks on a nice, pristine, pristine, clean copy of your data without having to worry about getting false positives from data changing underneath it from running it in a production environment. And you also get the performance benefits of what of a flash array itself. So it's not you're going to run in a, a degraded uh, performance mode. Um, one thing to be careful of is you run enough integrity check jobs you could bury a storage array. So you want to be careful on how many jobs you throttle against uh, unless you size uh, your storage array to accommodate you know, hundreds of thousands or, or millions of IOPS uh, as possible. Um, and then as I mentioned before, uh, you know, application troubleshooting, um, you know, there's just really a lot of different options. So just to touch on some other technologies, I know I sounded like a, a pure storage and a catalogic commercial. Um, it's not limited to, the, to just those technologies. They're just what I happen to work with, and it worked really well and very seamless. Um, Dell EMC also has similar uh, with their recover point capabilities um, in terms of replication and creating the consistency groups, uh, SRDF, um, SRDFA, IBM, as I mentioned earlier, with the sand volume controller. Uh, which is a very interesting thing about the IBM sand volume controller in that it's storage agnostic because you can hang a lot of different storage arrays. You can have you know, three different vendors underneath a sand volume controller and then still create the snapshots um, as part of it in, in a single consistency group. Uh, HPE 3PAR, um, Nimble is something we're going to get into um, probably later this month. I think, Ray? Yep. Um, so th there's certainly no vendor lock in, in, in providing this kind of capability. And I want to stress that, um, that you, I'm sure you have your preferences on different storage vendors, different technologies you want to do, so you're not limited to um, just a pure, uh, pure storage and a catalogic solution. So there are alternatives. I'm available to discuss anything. I'd, I'd love to hear if you're using something today um, and there's alternatives um, that we should be looking at as well. That's great. I'd love to hear about them. Um, so just some standard you know, housekeeping stuff here. So um, I'm certainly available. Uh, I'll be in the tech, tech exchange uh, for the most part tomorrow. Um, I'm certainly reachable by email uh, at um, balinski at intersystems.com. And then we're going to continue this discussion um, on disaster recovery for federated systems. We're going to cover on touch on uh, the continuation of this one with the flash flash array with Catalogic. Uh, and then also we're going to uh, discuss an option using recover point for VMware, which is completely storage agnostic. So that way, uh, show a different flavor uh, of, of how you can go about doing it, uh, even if you're using it in a hyper-converged uh, type solution. Um, and then there's a lot of learning tracks uh, available. Um, so then there's the survey, uh, and then the recordings will be made available uh, should you need to go back. And again, I'm, I'm available anytime. Um, should you need to follow up uh, discussions next week, next month, next year, um, the technology architects in, in, in my group, were, this is what we do. So if you have, ever have any questions on um, storage technologies, performance, HA, resiliency, we're your guys. And so with that, thank you. Any questions? <laughs>